Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Layo Olaride. We'll begin in Guinea-Bissau where calm has been restored as a heavy gunfire was reported in the capital in the early hours of today. Well, it comes after members of the National Guard freed the Finance Minister Suleiman Saidi and Secretary of State for the Treasury Antonio Montero who and took them to an unknown location. All the officials had been detained amid investigations into an alleged irregular withdrawal of $10 million of state funds. The release of the officials came to the attention of special forces who intervened after attempts to negotiate failed, resulting in an exchange of gunfire. Officials have called for calm in the West African country that has suffered a series of coups and attempted coups since gaining independence from Portugal in 1974. Madagascar's Constitutional Court has confirmed President Andre Rajoelina's re-election after a contentious vote two weeks ago. Mr. Rajoelina got 59% of the votes, securing a third term in office. The court also dismissed opposition complaints about vote credibility, despite a low 46% turnout and most opposition parties boycotting. Well, 10 out of 13 contenders withdrew from the race, expressing concerns about election credibility and urging supporters not to vote. While well, the president's two main rivals, Siteni and ex-president Mark Ravalomanana, received 14% and 12% of the votes, respectively. Well, U.S. President Joe Biden has welcomed Angolan President João Manuel Lorenco to the Oval Office, aiming to reaffirm his dedication to Africa, despite the two ongoing global wars dominating his administration's foreign policy focus. Well, during the meeting, President Lorenco commended President Biden's approach to the continent and expressed his country's interest in fostering stronger economic and security connections with the United States. The White House encounter follows Angola's strategic positioning as a key ally to the U.S. and its departure from Russian and Chinese influence under President Lorenko's leadership. Although President Biden seems likely to deviate from his promise to visit the continent this year, senior U.S. officials have undertaken crucial trips to Africa throughout 2023. Presidential hopeful in the upcoming general elections in the Democratic Republic of Congo, Martin Fayulu, is pledging zero tolerance on corruption to his supporters. He made this promise while visiting the restive eastern part of the country. Mr. Fayulu, who came second in the disputed 2018 presidential election, which he claimed to have won, is once again one of the main challengers to the incumbent President Felix Shisekedi. He was greeted by his supporters who lined the streets of Goma and then paraded alongside his motorcade while he waved at them and tapped his watch, a campaign symbol he uses to show that time is up for President Shisekedi. Well, elections in the Democratic Republic of Congo are expected to hold uh, this month on the 20th. Well, let's check in with the COP28 climate summit happening in Dubai, the United Arab Emirates. Britain's monarch, King Charles, is warning that the world is dreadfully far off track on addressing climate change and that the global economy would be in peril unless some things are quickly put in place. In an opening address at the COP28 UN climate summit, King Charles told world leaders the dangers of climate change are no longer a distant risk and urge them to take more action. After a year of record temperatures, the pressure is on for this year's summit to accelerate action to limit climate change. Countries, however, are divided over the future of fossil fuel, the burning of which is the main cause of climate change. I pray with all my heart that COP28 will be another critical turning point towards genuine transformational action at a time when already 
as scientists have been warning for so long, we are seeing alarming tipping points being reached. Unless we rapidly repair and restore nature's unique economy based on harmony and balance, which is our ultimate sustainer, our own economy and survivability will be imperiled. It worries me greatly that we remain so dreadfully far off track as the global stock take report demonstrates so graphically. How can we increase investments in regenerative agriculture, which can be a nature not belong to us? We belong to the earth. The 1.5 degree limit is only possible if we ultimately stop burning all fossil fuels, not reduce, not abate, phase out with a clear time frame aligned with 1.5 degrees. And the global stock tank must not only commit to that, it must also commit to triple renewables, double energy efficiency, and bring clean energy to all by 2030. The economics are clear, the global shift to renewables is inevitable. The only question is how much heating our planet will endure before it happens. So allow me to have a message for fossil fuel company leaders. Your old road is rapidly aging. Do not double down on an obsolete business model. Lead the transition to renewables using the resources you have available. Make no mistake, the road to climate sustainability is also the only viable pathway to economic sustainability of your companies in the future. And I urge governments to help industry make the right choice by regulating, legislating, putting a fair price on carbon, ending fossil fuel subsidies and adopting a windfall tax on profits. Joining us now on the show to shed more light on climate change issues, particularly in Africa, is climate change expert Professor John Osonwa. He's discussing with us from our Abuja studio. Welcome to the show, Professor. Thank you for being with us. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Now, we usually have these climate summits year in, year out. What should COP28 uh, achieve this year in tackling climate change? Uh, well, uh, as we have heard, what we really need is more unified action, bilateral action, uh, with strong political will to achieve what we all see as necessary to save the planet. Uh, right here in Africa, we're looking for more funding, uh, and I'm happy to see that this year, with this uh, climate change conference, Finally, the issue of loss and damage funding has been settled. Already we've seen about $500 million uh, that will be earmarked, activated for loss and, da uh, loss and damage for developing nations. Uh, we also need to see real transformative projects. Uh, there's a lot of talk about climate change these days, but the only way we're going to address climate change is to have real transformative projects that will cut across the whole spectrum of our economy. Uh, and that's some of the things that we are advocating. Uh, we have a lot of resources. Some of the things we deem to be challenges can be uh, tipped. We can reverse them to become our strengths. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a, in a moment. Well, you've mentioned, you know, uh, over $500 million being earmarked for developing countries. Uh, African countries are in attendance at, uh, you know, this summit. What should be their focus and how can these nations duly utilize uh, this fund? Uh, the focus, as I said, should be on transitioning away from fossil fuel whilst we can. Uh, a lot of these countries that are producing oil now are moving away. The UAE, Saudi Arabia, some other countries have started their journey to transition. The future of fossil fuels is doomed. Uh, we need to have 
a firm commitment to phase out, not phase down, phase out fossil fuels, and we can graduate that phase out. I don't care if it takes 20 years. We can begin with coal, which is the dirtiest fossil fuel, uh, and then we move on to petroleum, then eventually we move on to gas. Uh, there needs to be a transition away from fossil fuels. We cannot address the challenges of climate change without addressing the fact that we are still putting out over 30 billion tons of greenhouse gases every year into the atmosphere. That is just unsustainable, and we're beginning to see the effects in so many ways. So African countries, we need to do real uh, projects. Uh, we need to decarbonize uh, a lot of the things that we do. Uh, if you look at the way that we harness our gas in Nigeria, for instance, you have trillions uh, of cubic feet of gas in reserve. We are burning billions of cubic feet uh, as gas flaring, uh, but we can harness the same gas to solve five existential problems we have in Nigeria. We can harness the gas to provide power uh, to Nigerians, uh, direct to power plants. We can use it to power our vehicles, CNG, conversion of vehicles. You can use gas to, to, to substitute for fuel. Uh, you can use gas uh, for cooking, which will stop our deforestation problem or, or greatly reduce it. You can also use gas to make fertilizer. Urea fertilizer can be uh, produced with the gas reserves that we have, which will deal with our food security and agricultural issues. Uh, and then you create employment by doing all these things. So that one resource we have can be leveraged as we transition our way to net zero, can be leveraged to solve five major problems in Nigeria. Oh, you, you've, taught, you've touched a bit on my next questions. We know uh, more decisions will be taken at the summit, even as it continues in Dubai. But uh, how would it uh, affect the average man who is directly impacted by the, cli the, by the effects of climate change, uh, talking about flooding and uh, other effects that we've seen happen in the past years? Uh, the first thing we need to recognize is that the flooding that we're having now is going to be a recurring phenomenon. Uh, and the reason is because there are climate change factors that we need to reckon with now. Uh, if you look at what is happening around the world, we are seeing increased temperatures. Every year now, we are setting new records. I've already seen the record for this year. We're going to eclipse all the records from previous years that this year will be the hottest year on record. Record keeping began in 1888 in the U.S. And since that time, we've never seen a year as hot as this one, uh, uh, which was just the same thing with 2022. We've surpassed it. So rising temperature is going to lead to some unavoidable consequences. One, you're going to have increased desertification and drought, uh, drying up. Uh, that's what you're seeing uh, north of Nigeria now. The desert is encroaching into Nigeria. 3.5 uh, kilometers per year, desert encroachment. Well, we can't stop that unless we take drastic action. Uh, but more importantly, globally, you have the Arctic ice and all the glaciers on the, on the mountains. They are melting at a very rapid pace. Uh, Arctic ice has melted by over half. And we're talking about 30 million square kilometers of ice. Half of it has melted. So it's increasing the sea level. Uh, and the funny thing about the Arctic Circle is that it feeds all the major oceans of the world. Uh, it, it puts water into the Pacific Ocean, Atlantic, uh, Indian Ocean, and uh, the Atlantic Ocean affects us here in Africa. So that's why you see recurrent flooding, because the water does not have the free movement it used to have. The ocean is higher, so the water does not evacuate, particularly in the Biosa, uh, Niger Delta region. The water doesn't evacuate as quickly as it should, so it backs up, creates flooding. Then if you go to the north, the reason we're having flash flooding is because the ground has become aridified, so dry, almost like concrete. So when the rain falls, it doesn't absorb naturally the way it should. So those are issues we need to be cognizant of. Uh, so we need to take action. Floods will become recurrent. I said that in 2012 when we had the major one, uh, and unfortunately I've been proven right. We are going to have more floods. They will be more devastating. They will be more severe. 
because the warming temperature is also leading to increased precipitation. Right here in Abuja, we had torrential rain a couple of days ago, highly unexpected, uh, which is one of the uh, consequences of climate change. It leads to what we call weather variability. So we need to take real action. We need to build more dams. We need to harness our youth strength, youth strength uh, to strengthen our shorelines. We need to evacuate people who have historically been flooded. It means they are living on the floodplain. So that's what we can do with regard to flooding. Uh, but in terms of climate change action, since we're on the issue of what we can do, we need to do transformative projects, tree planting projects. We are giving money to so-called indigent Nigerians. That should be leveraged to some climate action, which will help us. Those people can help us shore up the, the, uh, the, uh, the shorelines with sandbags. They can plant trees. They can do something. NYAC people, a uh, million of them every year, we can leverage that huge uh, resource we have to deal with our climate issues. All right, then, uh, so much to learn from all that you uh, just told us. Professor John Osonwa, climate change expert, thank you so much for your insights. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. As South Africa marks 16 days of activism against gender-based violence, President Cyril Ramaphosa has expressed his government's commitment to rooting out patriarchy. Mr. Ramaphosa was speaking at the African Union's third men's conference on positive masculinity in Pretoria. South Africa is co-hosting the conference with the African Union chair and president of the Comoros, Azali Asumani. Well, this is on the back of the scathing report presented by Police Minister Becky Sele, showing that uh, over 10,000 women were raped between July and September this year in South Africa. We are meeting in a week that uh, the annual campaign of 16 days of activism against gender-based violence commences across the globe. In fact, President uh, uh, Salif Johnson referred to it as having gotten into the fourth day of this campaign. And in this respect, today's conference is one of many events being organized across the world to draw attention to this terrible scourge that is being perpetrated against the women and girls of our continent. Men and boys must be at the forefront of the change that must happen. We are also here because we know that there is an alternative to a society, a continent, and a world where women are oppressed, discriminated against, and their rights suppressed. There is an alternative. And this conference has been exploring that alternative through a number of presentations that have been made here. What type of world do we seek? We seek a world in which every African man, woman, and child can live in true freedom. Well, no fewer than 20,000 refugees are seeking asylum in Taraba State here in Nigeria after fleeing Amazonian attacks in the Republic of Cameroon. The refugees camping in five local government areas of Saldana, Kermi, Gashaka, Usa and Takum local government areas are appealing to federal and state governments as well as non-governmental organizations for assistance to ameliorate their sufferings while well, the state government has assured them of their safety and protection. As at March 2020, over 7,000 refugees had crossed over from the Republic of Cameroon seeking asylum in five local government areas of Taraba State. Three years down the line, the number has increased to over 20,000, with feeding, education, shelter, health and security becoming a challenge to the host communities as well as the state government. This has overstretched the state government, and it has summoned a multi-stakeholder meeting for announcement of protection 
and humanitarian assistance to liberate refugees and vulnerable host community members. As a government, we know that inclusion is the best way to support and prepare refugees so they can help rebuild their lives or their lives when conditions allow them to return back to their country in dignity. After two years of calling for a ceasefire in northwestern and southwestern provinces of the Republic of Cameroon, with no positive outcome, the United Nations High Commission for Refugees in collaboration with partners say the number is increasing. According to the United Nations, insecurity, difficult terrain, inadequate health facilities, dilapidated schools and shelter for refugees remains a bane for their efforts towards adequate protection of refugees in Taraba State. I've been noticing so many challenges like not having enough teachers, not having uh, enough classrooms and that's a big problem. Uh, Your Excellency, maybe you can help us with that. Appreciative of the development partner's role in confidence building, the state governor says his free education gesture covers the refugees also. Represented by the deputy, the governor insists that pockets of insecurity affecting the state is overwhelming. Not a talk of more of those seeking asylum, but he will do his best to foster a peaceful coexistence between the two neighbors. And to some entertainment news, the second edition of the Edo State International Film Festival has opened with the emotionally charged movie Scar. The Chris Enning directed film stars Mary Unjoku and Uzi Usman in a story that chronicles the chain of events following a religious colored conflict in a remote community in northern Nigeria. <laughs> Nigerian filmmakers meet with some of their international counterparts as the Edo State International Film Festival kicks off its second edition. After a short welcome by a local choral group, the evening settles into the business of the day, the screening of the emotionally charged scar. A movie about conflict, love, forgiveness and vengeance. It follows the story of a badly scarred missionary who had lost her entire family and half of her face to a religious conflict and how she must rise above a desire for vengeance to help new missionaries integrate into the community. For Mary Unjoku, who played the lead character, the movie opened up old scars. I'm not in that space anymore, yeah? So for me to... I didn't want to go back there. And that story pulled me back there and it kept pulling me back there every single day and it took a while for me to come out of that character more than two weeks you just realize that you're just sad all the time like you everything around you the costume the location the makeup it just gets you there the problem is getting out of that character after shoot was a problem Producer and co-lead cast Uzi Usman portrayed one of the terrorists who has repented and now dedicated his life to living with and helping this card missionary. For him, the movie will help provide a different perspective to the religious diversity induced challenges in the country. We deem it fit that we should be able to pass that message, we deem it fit that we should be able to do it so that people could be able to learn lesson and intercultural and interreligion marriages we needed to bring it out so that we will make people understand that Christian, Muslim, Hausa, Igbo, all, we're all together. The film festival received almost 500 films this year. And according to the festival director, this will catalyze the speedy development of the movie industry in the state. <laughs> I can tell you that Edo State was not um, 
top three or top five when we started this journey but i can tell you happily that we are at least top three now destination for shooting films and anything films at your state international film festival closes on saturday december the 2nd 2023And that's it on the program today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Layo Olarinde. Have a great weekend.